Welcome. So we have Max Tchaikovsky speaking today on vulnerability of uncertain Markov chains. Uh, Max, could you please begin? Yes, so thank you very much for the kind invitation for the seminar. Um, yes, so I'm Max uh, from Alborg University and um, I'm going to talk about the vulnerability of uncertain Markov chains, which is a joint work with, um, yeah, all the names you see on, on the slide, Luca, Radu, Kim, Mirko, and uh, Andrea from, yeah, pretty much, uh, yeah, all over Europe, I would say. Okay, so let's um, maybe start with a kind of very high level description of the talk. Okay, let me change. Okay, good, working. So um, if uh, one wants to kind of summarize the whole uh, uh, message in one slide, then this would be pretty much it. What we can see here, um, can you see my cursor if I move it? Yes. Yes. Great. So um, on the left hand side, we see something that is um, well known or was well known. And on the right hand side, we see something that has been done essentially in this paper by us. And on the left, it's essentially about the probability of Markov chains, which uh, you can think of uh, also for model reduction technique which allows you to yeah, simulate original dynamical systems by smaller dynamical systems while preserving uh, quantities um, or properties of solutions. So in this case, since it's about Markov chains, what we preserve is uh, um, yeah, the solution of the Kolmogorov equations, which are denoted by this pi, which is the transit probability of being in state i and time t. So essentially, the lumpability allows you to relate the original Markov chain to a smaller Markov chain while preserving um, the probability of being in a uh, set of states of the original Markov chain. So this uh, is essentially this arrow here. And this arrow here was um, some, let's say, logical characterization of this reduction, which was happening by means of um, yeah, continuous time temporal logic. And here below you see the complexity. So the complexity to compute the smallest possible uh, um, Markov chain under certain constraints, let's say. So what we have done on the right hand side was to extend the whole setting to uh, uncertain Markov chains where the rates are not given, but they are coming from intervals essentially. And then instead of having um, trajectories, so solutions, uh, what you get are essentially reachable sets or reach tubes. And what you see here is instead of preserving trajectories, we now preserve reach tubes of uh, the original and the reduced uncertain Markov chain. And then we have also logical characterization. And then we have also an algorithm that is computing the best possible reduction. Okay, so this is essentially the very high level view. And now let's get more, uh, yeah. I mean, I will still try to keep it very high level and um, but hope to get kind of the main message across in more detail. So the motivation for Markov chains, why do we want to study these? Um, well, they are the, let's say, the underlying many high level formalisms, if you like. So for instance, uh, stochastic process algebra give rise to a Markov chain or can one can devise, uh, devise a uh, Markov chain semantics for stochastic process algebra. Likewise, for chemical reactions, one can devise um, um, a Markov chain semantics for Petri nets, you can do this, and also for queuing networks. Um, in practice, however, what often is the case is that um, parameters in all these formalisms are not really known, or at least they are maybe measured with some um, uh, tolerance. So. Rather than having concrete uh, numbers, it's actually more something like a, um, and you you raised your hand, Vlad? Oh yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I just wanted to clarify so about chemical reaction networks because we had a talk about chemical reaction networks uh, earlier. Just to, uh, to understand, so here, uh, uh, can you time mark of chain uh, will be not will give not the same equations as mass action kinetics, right? So mass action kinetics will be like mean field approximation of uh, the equations given by uh, Markov chain. Yes, so there are, um, there is also this ODE semantics, let's say, for chemical reaction networks, indeed. 
and they will uh, give something different the markov chains but there is a connection to them um, which means uh, in particular that you can define a sequence of markov chains by carefully choosing the parameters that you have in your chemical reaction network such that the sequence of markov chains will converge in probability to the ode semantics so there is a connection between them but uh, they are uh, different from each other indeed especially um, if you have uh, very large populations in your Markov chain, let's say, so many A's, many B's, many E's and so on, then you can nicely approximate the, this Markov chain by this ODE system. But if you have low population numbers, then the stochastic nature is taking over and then the mean field limit does not work uh, oh. anymore or does not hold anymore, let's say. Okay, yeah, thank you. Thank you for clarifying. Yeah, thanks for, for asking. Um, Yes, so um, I have an additional question to this. Yes, please. Um, yeah, so, uh, so you, uh, you mentioned that um, uh, this can be viewed as a uh, um, model reduction. So I wonder uh, what kind of model reduction uh, this would provide for the examples that you, uh, we have on the screen. Um, the model reduction discussed by the um, of the Markov chains. Yes. Right. So um, the um, what you can show is, for instance, is okay. This is not in this work, but it's in another work. But uh, what you can do is you can devise um, a Markov chain for this. Um, for those chemical reaction networks. And then you can uh, show that you can reduce by means of this lumpability, the original Markov chain to a smaller Markov chain, which then will underlie the chemical reaction network where you preserve sums of species. So for instance, something like A plus B. So on the level of ODEs, what you would get Roughly speaking, is a ODE system which would uh, recover a sum of variables. Instead, on the level of the Markov chain, you would get the same thing, sum of A's and B's, but now on the level of the Markov chain. Thank Does you. Clarify? Yes, thank you. OK. Um, yes, and actually, since we speak about this, so for queuing networks, there are also um, fluid limits result. And um, I think they call them somehow differently, but uh, um, yeah, I don't remember, but something with limits. <laughs> and um, the, the moral of the story is also quite the same. You increase like the number of, um, of jobs in the queue and you send them to infinity and then you scale. And then you can show that essentially this buffer becomes like not a discrete variable, but a kind of continuous variable and then you can uh, model very large queuing networks um, under a certain regime efficiently using these um, instead of Markov chains. Okay, so right. So okay, so now we, uh, we I was speaking about that in many practical systems, what you would have is um, that um, the parameters may be uncertain, right? And uh, you still want to say something about uh, the system in particular, you want to analyze it more efficiently. Okay, so, and uh, this is the reason why we want to first introduce uncertain continuous time Markov chains because they will essentially allow us to do this kind of take account of, to account for this uncertain parameters. But before we do so, a very quick review on lumpability so that uh, we are kind of on the same page. So here is a very simple toy model consisting of three states. And those arcs denote essentially that, okay, if uh, my Markov chain has here three states and if I'm in state two, then I can go from state two and state one with the transition rate uh, two to one. Okay, so now in this case, what lumpability or ordinal lumpability, how it's sometimes called, um, can tell us is that you know, if from going from two to one and going from three to one happens with the same rate, so we have a kind of um, symmetry in the system, then we can essentially lump together two and three. And uh, then 
come up with this Markov chain where the rates are such that, um, well, from two to one, we go with the rate that uh, we assume to, to be the one, the metric here. And from one to two, we essentially sum those two rates that we had before. And now this Markov chain has now the prop, uh, property that um, we know that the probability in being in state two of this lumped or reduced Markov chain is equal to the probability of being in state two or three in the original Markov chain at any point in time. Instead for the state one, it's essentially identical. So we can the mobility allows us to recover um, um, sums of probabilities of our original um, with respect to the reduced or lumped Markov chain. Okay, and um, it can be lumpability can be described by uh, an equivalence relation, and equivalence relations can be equivalently described by partitions, which are essentially the quotients under those equivalences, uh, equivalence relations. And um, we say that um, elements that are in the same block cycle are called H equivalent if H is essentially our lumpability at, um, at hand. And this theorem is essentially what I was telling, uh, like in the special case of this example, it says that uh, lumpability is uh, ages and lumpability, but only if we have this um, um, reservation of uh, blocks of probabilities. Now, this is a very rough and quick intro to uh, lumpability. And now we go for the next step of introducing the uncertain continuous time mark of chains. Uh, I have a question about the notation from the previous slide. Yes. Um, so what's the precise meaning of the three horizontal lines? Three. Ah, okay, right. It's the um, equivalence of uh, functions of time. So what I mean by writing pi one uh, equivalence pi one hat is that it's the transient probability. So if I write p1, of t, then it means the probability of being in state one and time t. And what this example is telling us is that if those transition rates, which now be, can be also time dependent, they coincide as functions over time. So think, for instance, about the kind of, yeah, if you would have a queuing network, for instance, that we have seen before, you may have a transition rate. That depends on time because maybe customers arrive in the morning with a different rate than in during the lunch break, for instance. And here, uh, we, we want, what we want to say is that if the transition rates coincide, so those two guys over here coincide as functions over time, then the probabilities will coincide as functions over time. Does thank this you. clarify? Yes, thank you. Okay, so now we define the uncertain Markov chains. And um, the idea is essentially that if we have a classic, let's say, continuous time Markov chain, we have the states and we have the transitions or transition rates. Here, what we want to provide is um, essentially an interval, let's say, small m, big m, or two matrices, if you like, which are the lower bounds and the upper bounds, respectively which means that the transition rates that we have should be uh, between small m and big m. And uh, there are functions of time uh, measurable, uh, for instance. And here we have an example, um, which, uh, well, let's say syntactic example, which uh, considers two concurrent machines. And so I'm using here implicitly a kind of, let's say, process algebra-like notation. But um, if you're not into process algebra, don't worry. It's just a high-level example. So in the end of the day, we have two uh, concurrent processes, if you like, two machines. And each machine can be in a, a state on or off. And now we can have all the four different combinations. Uh, so each machine is either on or off. So we have either on on or on off or off on or off off. And now um, we have those uh, intervals on, uh, on the arcs, which means that um, the transition from, for instance, on off to on on is between um, alpha underline and alpha overline. 
at any point in time. So it's like in the last slide where we had this um, equivalence between transition rates. Now, the, since the transition rates can vary in time, we say, okay, it's for all time, points in time, the transition rate is between uh, those bounds. And we do so for all the transitions in, uh, in this, um, in the smart blockchain, which essentially does the following. If we have both machines on uh, in state on, then well, either the left machine goes off or the, uh, the right machine goes off or the left machine goes off. Then here the left machine can fire back again. And uh, likewise, you can continue to uh, shut down the, the machines. And then we have here this um, gamma transitions, which kind of flip the uh, uh, the states of the machines, uh, which is a yeah, we call it migration rate here. Okay, and to connect this example now to this notation over here, what we mean by small m would be essentially all the underlines. So alpha underline, beta underline, and so on. And big M instead is exactly the right one. So essentially you can define this uncertain continuous time Markov chain by providing the extremal Markov chains, which then describe the, the domain where the transitions can, can live. Okay, and now we come to this rich tube semantics that I mentioned in the first slide, and now we make it uh, yeah, more formal. So if, um, so consider for, uh, for a second, the extreme case for small m and big m are equal to each other. Then Q would be determined, fully determined. It would be equal to small m, big m, because both are equal to each other, right? And then what we get here is nothing else than, um, well, we provide a block H, which then computes the sum of the transit probabilities at time tau of, uh, of being in this block H at time tau. And how do we compute this? Well, we need to satisfy the former Komogorov equations, which are given here. Uh, partial denotes the, uh, the, the, the derivative with respect to time, and big T denotes the transpose. And um, so if small m and big m are equal, then this tells us essentially just allows us to compute the transit probabilities of being in a certain uh, transit probability of being in a block H and time point tau. If we start from the probability distribution of uh, pi zero at time zero. Now, if small m and big m are really different from each other, then what we get here is essentially all the possible all the possible probabilities under the transit uh, transit sorry trans, uh, transition rates that we are allowed to pick. So if we can, if we visualize it, um, what we get is something like that. So we start from pi zero here. Now we pick one Q that is satisfying those constraints here. Now this also a sequation, and now we pick maybe some block, whatever the block may be, and we can plot the transit probability across the time t. So the tau is varying essentially, or this tau is this t here, and then you get essentially a trajectory. If you pick another a transition rate, then we get another trajectory, and so on. And if we consider all the set all, of all the possible um, transition rate functions or transition rate matrices, we get essentially a reach tube. And um, yes, and the relation to verification or optimal control is that usually, I mean, if you consider a control system, you would have here something like X, and then you wouldn't have something uh, like this linear stuff over there, but you would have some f, uh, x, and then q would be usually called u. And then you could ask yourself things like, OK, how can I maybe, uh, what is the maximal value I can get here? What is the minimal value and stuff like this? Um, right, so now one can relate this, let's say, control, uh, control system inspired uh, view also to MDP semantics. Uh, I'm not going to discuss it here, but uh, it's discussed in the paper. And the rough idea is you can um, you can always turn a continuous time Markov chain into a, or you can relate it to a embedded discrete time Markov chain. And um, 
in fact, this relation corresponds to uh, applying uh, the Euler method to the forward Kolmogorov equations. And if you make now the steps in this Euler method very small by discretizing the ODE system, you essentially, what you are essentially doing is you are traversing a discrete time Markov chain and at each point in time you are, you have to pick as, uh, as uh, an action, if you like, the, um, the transition rate that you want to have on this small interval of time. And this picking you can interpret as uh, picking an action and this overall thing then gives rise to a Markov decision process. So you can relate also this thing here to a Markov decision process uh, semantics. Okay, so let's continue now with the UCTMC vulnerability. So we introduced the UCT, UCTMC um, and um, UCTMC semantics and um, sorry, the, yeah, the, the UCTMC and the UCTMC semantics. And now we want to um, define the vulnerability, which is um, the kind of main message of uh, or main definition of this talk. So now, in the case where we would have against a situation versus lower and upper bounds coincide, what you would uh, see is that this H given here, which is essentially saying that we don't care about the order of which machine is on and off. We just essentially care how many machines are on and how many machines are off. Uh, then this would be a lumpability uh, partition. And we can check this by, again, like in this simple example at the beginning, we take two states and now we see, okay, this transition and this transition, they would coincide if the upper and lower uh, bounds are equal. Now, what if um, we wouldn't have this? So if uh, now the lower and upper bounds are indeed bigger, then please note, um, this is not trivial anymore um, or not a trivial application of uh, the usual lumpability anymore because now I could pick here maybe alpha underline and here I could pick alpha overline, which would then break the symmetry of lumpability per se. So we would not be able to infer that we can lump it again. Um, and this is where um, this UCTMC comes, uh, lumpability comes in and it's, uh, is find in a very natural way, I would say. It says, well, you are a lumpability if, if and only if you are lumpability on the extremo, or you are UCTMC lumpability if you are a CTMC lumpability on the extremo Markov chains, which are those with small m and big m. <clears throat> and um, the definition of the lumped UCTMC is unnatural because, well, we know now that for the extremal mark of chains that we have the CTMC lumpability. Now, if you apply the UCTMC, uh, sorry, the lumping uh, of lumpability to either of either uh, of one of the either uh, extremal uh, mark of chains, we will get essentially the same UCTMC uh, modulo the transition rates. That is so. What would be the lump UCTMC here? Let's uh, repeat again the things that we have uh, written on uh, the last slide. And now with this partition being in, in place, uh, we would get the following thing. So this on the left is the same thing we have seen in the last slide, but the lump lumping is essentially as you would expect it from the CTMC lumping, right? Because if you strip away, let's say the upper values, you can just lump it. But now you need also to take care of the upper values. So you would get this lumped UCTMC here, which is again a UCTMC, meaning that you have intervals instead of just numbers on the on the arcs. And in particular, this um, lumped UCTMC has now also the, the interpretation, the same semantical interpretations that you have rich tubes of probabilities. Okay, now this is just a recap from the semantics I, uh, we, uh, we have seen before. And now we can uh, provide the first um, result, which says that um, H is a UCTMC lumpability, so meaning that the extremal 
Markov chains or H is a lumpability on the extremal Markov chains. If and only if the reachable sets of the original and the lump at this UTMC coincide. And uh, so here is like what we are brought up here, one to one. But on this side, we have the reachable sets of the lump UCTMC. And now you can also see why we were um, introducing this reachable sets already for blocks. Because what the statement is saying is that. Uh, as, as long as we are concerned only with the cumulative behavior on the blocks, across the blocks, we preserve uh, the behavior uh, on the lump Markov chain. And please note here, we have, it's a single, so it's really one state of uh, lumped of the UC, uh, lumped UCTMC will describe the probabilities of uh, a block in the original UCTMCs. I use it MC. Okay, so this is the, um, if you recall the first um, slide that we discussed, uh, this is kind of three lines. We, we did know essentially this first line where we showed that we preserve the rich cubes. Now we go for the next slide, which was about this logical stuff. And um, here, um, what we do first, we define essentially the we consider an uncertain version of a so-called uh, continuous stochastic logic, which is a version of a temporal logic. Um, we extend it to uncertain um, Markov chains. And the idea is uh, um, quite natural. Um, what we essentially say is that a formula or a UCTMC satisfies a certain temporal logical formula if and only if this formula holds true under all possible CTMC realizations of this UCTMC in the classic uh, continuous plastic logic that we have for continuous uh, time mark of chains. So what different, uh, what this logic, so this uh, logic for UCTMC is doing is um, um, if a formula is true, then it's true under all possible realizations of uncertainty. So you can use it as a kind of for robust verification or verification in the, in the, in the situation where certain rates are not certain or some, some rates are not certain. So you want to be sure that across all realizations, you would have this property um, to all true. Okay. And, um, now we can define uh, the logical characterization, which is saying that um, calligraphic H is a UCTMC lumpability um, if and only if this formula holds true in the original UCTMC, then it's also satisfied for the lumped UCTMC, and um, which is denoted by this. Uh, Hat because we used hat to denote the uh, lumped uh, UCTMC stuff. Um, where H is uh, one block or equivalent class, if you like, in our UCTMC lumping, and uh, I is arbitrary. Um, yes, so there are some, some few little things one has to make sure. So atomic propositions must be respected on H, so which means that if you define like a atomic proposition that uh, says whatever, this state is blue, <laughs> then, uh, and you have a UCTMC lumpability that is um, consisting of state one and two, let's say, then both states should be satisfying this blue, which is um, not really a restriction because what you can do is you can, well, visit la later in a second, I think, you can, um, make sure that you find the best possible uh, UCTMC lumpability that is uh, uh, respecting those atomic propositions. Okay, here's a technical remark that you really need to, this characterization works on this X3ness, which X means it's the next state. It's, uh, um, yeah, I think this can, this is more of a technical discussion. It could, well, since we, I mentioned anyway. So one could inc incorporate this, uh, this so-called next formulas in the logical characterization. The problem would be then that we would 
miss out the uh, quantitative characterization on the last slide because then uh, so the things are kind of excluding each other, let's say. Um, good, okay, and now we come to the, to the algorithms that I was kind of um, referring to, uh, implicitly at least, in the, in, the, in the last slide. So, and the idea is, um, okay, now we are provided by um, the say UCTMC, and we ask ourselves, okay, can we find now a lumpability? Or how can we find a UCTMC lumpability on that? Now, the good thing is that the, there are algorithms that, computing, uh, that are computing uh, lumpability for CTMCs. So, and uh, in particular, um, what one has is uh, so-called partition finite algorithms, which uh, take as input an arbitrary initial partition, and then they provide the coarsest lumpability that refines this initial partition. So in this algorithm in particular, this is what we do in uh, step two. So how does it work? Let's take a look. So we have this um, UCTMC that is given, providing us this lower and upper bounds. Now we pick the initial partition that can be any partition and that must not be a lumpability at all. So for instance, it could be such that the blocks of this H could be such that only states that have the same uh, atomic propositions put together. And now what we do first, we compute the coarsest lumping H prime of the Markov chain, so not the UCTMC, but really the CTMC, VM, that refines H. And this happens by means of a partition refinement algorithm that uh, had, is known since um, at least 25 years, I would say, and um, which can be done quite fast. Now, if you get this H prime, this H prime is now the coarsest uh, um, CTMC lumping on this Markov chain. But we would like to find at the end of the day a UCTMC lumping that is a lumping that is. Um, a lumping not just with respect to small m, but also with respect to big m. So what we do now is we continue here and take now this h prime from this line two here and say, okay, please compute now the coarsest lumping of this Markov chain with the upper bounds with respect to h prime. So we refine forcer. And we do so until we don't refine anymore. And uh, at some point we will reach this number four here because the set of states is finite. So the number of refinements is finite. And uh, the worst case, we will uh, refine all blocks such that we will have only singleton blocks, but uh, there will be a termination eventually. And uh, now this theorem is a direct consequence of the fact that um, the complexity results for a lumping for Markov chains that are, uh, yeah, yeah, CTMCs rather than UCTMCs. And um, it's uh, um, rather uh, efficient, so it's polynomial. It has essentially it's linear in the number of arcs and the number of states, because the slog nodes is essentially the constant. Um, you can think of arcs as the as the size of the forward Kolmogorov equation. So the, the number of entries you would have in the forward Kolmogorov equation because each arc gives rise to one um, yeah, linear monomial in the, in the Kolmogorov equations, right? Okay, so now some, uh, some case studies and the relation. Um, so what we did was we took uh, CTMCs that have been around and um, what we what we then did was to take for every transition rate in the in the published Markov chain, we said okay. As a, since we often don't know whether this is really the true value or maybe this value has been measured and so on, we apply a kind of um, um, precision. Uh, of measurement here, x. So if x is 0, 0, 0.05, then it would mean essentially that we have measured with 5% uh, precision. And we run then the, uh, the algorithm on those uh, published um, CTMC benchmarks. And we see here essentially the size of the original Markov chain. Then for uh, check, we see 
how the mark uh, the lampability was the usual CTMC lampability was performing before we did this perturbation and then we see the UCTMC lampability and uh, it can be noted that uh, I think uh, well the, the results are pretty much comparable and you can uh, reduce uh, quite substantially the the number of uh, original models and uh, for the models instead so the, there are here um, three families essentially which uh, had all a kind of size parameter so in this workstation clusters this n the parameter size parameter n was referring to i don't remember what but maybe the number of clusters and the cell cycle control in eukaryotes it was referring to i think um, the, the initial condition how many populations you had because this Markov chains they grow up quite fast as um, yes and we stopped each time when we were around out of memory good so to uh, finish uh, or yes okay i'm approaching 40 minutes so uh, there is a rich body of literature was of related work uh, because many people have done things on markov chains and uh, here we have uh, just uh, let's say some there are many more um, there is um, since the uncertain continuous time mark of chains allow for this MDT semantics that I briefly mentioned before. There is sort of close connections to yeah, uncertain or bounded MDPs or parametric mark of chains or MDPs or interval valued mark of chains. And uh, there is also some relation to control theory where um, in particular the work of Papas, Tabuda and um, yeah, many, many other more where um, there is this notion of consistent abstraction, which usually is applied to linear control systems. But since Kolmogorov equations can be kind of sought as uh, yeah, linear systems, or at least uh, what's called bilinear systems, then uh, you have also these relations there. OK, future work. Yeah, well, um, of course, one wants to go for the nonlinear case. And this looks good. Uh, we, we have some something in preparation. And then one can go for, um, instead of having just sums, one could go for generic linear transformations or generic nonlinear transformations. And then, of course, uh, discrete space um, uh, control systems. And I think that's about it. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you. All right. Um... Questions? Yeah, I, I, I want to clarify a bit about, uh, about the, the, the setup. So uh, you said that for each, uh, for each rate, we have lower and upper bound, right? Uh, um, yes. Right, and then we try to lump uh, like lower bound separately and upper bound separately. Uh, but now in principle, if I um, say I, I, I have uh, upper bound at some for some uh, transition two and for other transition three. And as soon as this doesn't lump, but if I uh, artificially increase upper bound for one of the transitions from two to three, it becomes lumpable, mm -hmm. right? Uh, can you take, take such things into account? So if I kind of uh, make my bounds more pessimistic, I get bad reductions. Does it, does it happen? And if, 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 if yes, uh, what, what do you do? Yes, thank you for the question. It's a good question. So, um, yes, so this, um, mm, if you have this symmetry on the uncertainties or the, on the intervals, then you know that you can preserve, um, let me maybe, then you go, uh, you know that you have really equivalence here. Um, now, of course, you may violate the symmetries because maybe, uh, yeah, the symmetry is not there and you cannot do much about it unless you start to uh, maybe adjust uh, the the intervals by making as you said um, uh, maybe some upper bound bigger so that then the the upper bounds coincide and this is indeed possible and what you can show then is that this thing here becomes an over approximation so it's a subset relation then because every um, behavior that you have so to speak in the you had in the original Markov chain, or, or sorry, original uncertain Markov chain is now, can be now captured in this kind of um, uh, more pessimistic uncertain Markov chain. And this uncertain 
pessimistic and certain Markov chain becomes lumpable. So there for that, for this over approximation, so to speak, you have the reduction. So you have a, a subset relation there. So you can do this. And uh, yes, we uh, we did not uh, push for it because we were, uh, but we were thinking to do this if in the case the uh, benchmarks wouldn't have been uh, uh, already looking uh, that nice, but uh, uh, they were already uh, at least to our satisfaction looking nice. So we were uh, not pushing for over approximation, but it is possible indeed. Okay, I see. I see. So, so you can get better reduction at the price of, of uh, not having uh, uh, equality for the reachable sets. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. Thank you. Um, I have a quick question. Um, in, so, in your benchmark table, um, so there are reductions like from a couple of million to one million things like that. Um, does it make uh, the result? uh really more useful um <clears throat> you mean that uh, you cannot um you find the reduction time still to to be too large or what is the uh, uh, so the resulting uh the resulting size of the model mm -hmm. Ah, okay. The, the okay, I see, I see. So you, uh, so the idea is like, okay, uh, you get a reduced model that is maybe still too large, right? Right. Or other things that you couldn't do with the original model, but now you can do with the new model uh, since it's smaller. Yes. So, yeah. So usually, what what one does is okay. So these numbers are indeed very large, and um, what you what you do is. Uh, you cannot solve really this forward Kolmogorov equations due to numerical reasons. And you cannot do this even um, with the reduced ones unless they are really small. Um, nevertheless, what, uh, what, you can, uh, what you can do then is you can still simulate. And if you have smaller uh, reactions and stuff like that, so for instance, in the chemical, um, chemical reaction networks, if you can reduce the um, UCTMC underlying uh, chemical reaction network, you will have less uh, reactions and then you can run the simulation faster, for instance, even though you have a state space that is very large. Thank you. And so with the future work that you mentioned, uh, uh, more diverse uh, transformations like uh, more, uh, more general linear combinations and nonlinear transformations, you, you would hope that those numbers will go down, right? Um, yes. So um, maybe let me clarify here. What I mean by nonlinear control systems, for instance, is that we would uh, go for uh, really uh, instead of forward Kolmogorov equations, which are linear and which are usually super large, uh, we would go for uh, yeah, really nonlinear control systems, which maybe have only, I don't know, 50 equations, 100 equations. And now if you reduce them to a smaller size, uh, you may hope to get something uh, there due to the reduction power. So this would be one thing. And the other thing, linear, generic linear transformations, yes, indeed, uh, this would also uh, increase the power of reduction. So potentially would get smaller redu reduced models, yeah. And so you, you, you probably have some examples of this, right? So not just in theory with algorithms, but maybe some, some actual examples, right? So with those kinds of transformations. Um, for the, um, for the, for the for first the, one. For the generic linear transformations of, and for non-linear transformations. No, this is actually uh, future work really future work. The first one, we have a kind of good idea. This would be essentially going for the, uh, so I assume you have a chemical reaction network and you have um, now, uh, instead of going for the Markov chain and define an uncertain Markov chain, you define um, an, yeah, a control system because now the rates become uh, essentially controls which are in some parameter space. And now you want to, to lump this. And there you would have, uh, for instance, examples of uh, yeah, symmetries. Essentially, many things that already apply for uh, the usual reduction. 
um, like the metric binding signs and uh, sites and uh, things like that. Uh, for the linear ones and nonlinear ones, it's actually uh, this has to be has to be z. Does this answer the question? Thank you. More questions. All right, thank you again. Thank you for the invitation.